Hello everyone, it is Pal Ponder on Weather coming at you with another video. In this update, I'm gonna go over my overall winter thoughts for 2019, 2020, and why I think this is gonna be the coldest winter in six years and potentially more, and why I made my official winter outlook uh, and some of the reasoning behind it. Uh, before I do get started, if you do like weather-related content, please subscribe to my channel as I will upload about five videos a week uh, to keep you updated all right so let's get started so yes it was a, a record cold temperatures uh this morning and here's the overall uh daily and some all-time record cold temperatures for the united states a good a hundred of them this this morning i know in the dallas war with area we hit 22 the all-time record was 21 back in 1911 so it came really close. I know we did break it in Waco at 25. I know Chicago hit eight or just some of the records, but you can see the daily records and the, and the, and the black is the all time uh, November record. So it was a very cold morning for November 12th. All right, and so here's some of the temperatures that uh, took place this morning. You can see all the way down to 20, 21, 22 degrees in the Dallas-Fort Worth area all the way down to the deep south, but m single digits for much of the central part of the country and even below zero in parts of uh, Iowa and in, in Minnesota. And some of the wind chills were even a lot colder than that. You know, a lot of this area in green is well below zero, 10, 20 degrees below zero wind chills this morning. So it was by far the, the, the coldest temperatures of the season that we experienced so far. And so here is, you know, what's the reasoning behind 1911? So I know I follow the solar cycles a lot. And right now we're in solar cycle uh, 24, and you can see 75% of the days have no sunspots. That's basically gonna be on target to break the last solar cycle, solar cycle 23, which had 71% of the days. That year was the coldest in the United States in 25 years. So if you go back, and a lot of these records that, that, that were broken or even close to broke this morning were all the way back from 1911. All right, so here are some of the solar cycles that of the last uh, 100 years. And, you, and here's the one from uh, solar cycle 14 back from that 1911 era, which would you could see the solar minimum bottomed out right around 1911. And so this is no coincidence why we're, we're in solar cycle 24 and it's, and it's in the expansion of, of bottoming out and we still potentially have a more, you know, six more months to go through the heart of winter. And so you can see the, uh, the peak, the trough is almost the same height. So we have a lot of similarities uh, to, solar cycle 14 than we do for solar cycle 24. Um, and so what happened and what did happen in actually 1911 for the United States, it was actually the coldest November ever. And these records go back to 120 years. So the average temperature was 37 degrees. Uh, so it did warm up in December, which was relatively mild, which I kind of been talking about that we're going to have a a cold November and maybe rebound and then go into the deep freeze in January and go into a late winter. So what happened in January 12th was the seventh coldest January on record. And the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota were the coldest Januaries on record. These are records, like I said, dating back to 120 years. Minneapolis of St. Paul set a record 186 consecutive hours below zero. Sioux Falls, South Dakota went below zero for 121 hours. All right, so these are dangerous cold temperatures, what happened in 1911. So that kind of raises your eyes when you're breaking records or near records back from 100 and 110 years ago of what actually took place back then. In February was a little bit less extreme, but still the 23rd coldest February on record for the continental United States. What happened in March? Late winter, right? 1912, second coldest March on record, okay? What happened that year? That's the year that Niagara Falls froze over completely. So, you know, when I made my winter outlook 
and talked about the sixth coldest winter on record. I know one of the comments was, you know, you're pretty bold for going well below uh, average temperatures for one third of the country. No, I was actually being somewhat conservative in that forecast and I'm still sticking with that, but this is definitely an anomaly that could potentially happen. Some of the coldest winters, 1976, 77 are not off the table. Okay, so that could transpire, but right now officially, I'm going with the coldest winter in six years. And so some of the reasoning behind that, uh, here's the overall ocean temperatures and you can see this dark red around Alaska. Alaska has been experiencing record cold temperatures. I know this morning it was 32 degrees in Anchorage and 22 in Dallas. So when you have that kind of anomaly where it's colder in Dallas than it is in Alaska, there's something going all over gone in the overall pattern and you get what they call high latitude blocking and allows that cold Arctic air to pour all the way down into the deep south. And you can see the, the warm temperatures around Alaska. So you have that blocking pattern. And then you have some of these warm temperatures that are, that are hugging the coast are gonna play a key role in the cold weather and in the snow too, because you're gonna have that, these convergence. You need warmer ocean temperatures for precipitation. And so when that cold air meets the, the warm ocean temperatures, you're gonna have that kind of an overriding effect, the convergence zone, the baroclinic zone, where that snow is pushed inland. And that's where I have the predominant snow track around the central part of the eastern part of the United States around this area right here, if you go back and look at my winter forecast. And so the science behind the, the polar vortex, uh, right now, that's pretty much in a kind of a, a zonal flow. But as we transition, and we've already transitioned a lot sooner than we normally do, um, it tends to buckle when deeper into the winter months. And so it allows that uh, instead of that cold air being pulled up and kept in the Arctic, it buckles, it becomes wavy, and it dips down and allows the cold air to dip down further south. And so here's kind of the transition between fall and, and winter. And so you get the increased Siberia snowpack and we're gonna go over that. It's pretty extreme this year. And so when that happens, that kind of activates the polar vortex as we get deeper into the winter months and then allows it to become more, like I said, more wavy or buckle. And then it allows that colder air to funnel in and pour into the central and Eastern part of the United States. And so here is the overall snowpack as of this morning and you can see it's pretty ext extreme over siberia and a pretty healthy snowpack over canada as well as the northern third uh, of the united states and it was uh, pretty ex so extreme it was actually the third largest so far since 1967. so you need that cold air and that's only gonna um, as these systems come down uh, throughout winter it's got to go over that snowpack, right? And so it's going to have less time to modify uh, the cold air. So it's going to even it's kind of a feed off itself over the winter months as this keeps building south. It allows that cold air to even spill further south and further south as we go deeper into the winter months. And so, and here's another event that typically transpires in winter is what they call a stratospheric warming event. Right now, the Arctic Circle is warm and you know cold air has got to go somewhere so if the arctic is warm down below it is typically colder because the cold air has to go somewhere and so what typically happens is if you have if you have what they call these arctic uh, stratospheric warming events the arctic spikes and uh, spikes like 70 degrees and then typically you have a, what they call a displacement and that cold air will be funneled down and eventually buckle the polar vortex, have the negative NAO, and allow that cold air to transpire down into the United States. And typically that's about a 20 to uh, 30 day lag when you have these, what they call stratospheric warming events. And so here is the, what they call an, an, like a negative NAO. When that transpires, it, it starts with the Siberia snowpack, activates the polar vortex, have the stratospheric warming event, <laughs> and it funnels down and it's kind of a chain reaction. And you can see the high pressure over Alaska. Let me show the temperatures again, right here. That's where that blocking high, it allows that cold Arctic air dip in the jet stream from the polar vortex. 
you have the blocking with the high uh the ridge over here and you, and, and we're stuck in the middle right <laughs> and so the cold air's got to go somewhere and it's coming coming to the united states this year and i think this is predominantly how this is going to transpire throughout the winter months and so here's the overall snowpack and it's pretty healthy that's as of this morning and this started back in September of uh, September 30th, and you uh, that had that healthier snow uh, in, in Montana. Remember when they had that four feet? And slowly but surely, that that colder air, that snowpack has been shifting further east as we went into October and had that big snow event in the Dakotas, and then it's it's you know shifting even further east now when we're finally getting some snow and. Uh, Chicago, Minnesota, and of course we had that snowstorm that's transpiring now that dumped a, uh, I know a foot of snow in uh, Buffalo yesterday, and it's still a little bit lingering on this morning. And so here's the overall uh, teleconnections for the next two weeks. The models have not been any help. You know, beyond two weeks, they've all shown warm, but once you hit two weeks, so somehow they kind of make that transition and they flip to cold. So. And that's what's been transpiring over the last couple of weeks. Anything longer than two weeks out has been showing a lot warmer. And then every day within two weeks, it transitions to colder, then colder to colder. And you can see the inside the teleconnections of the EPO, we remain negative for the next two weeks, as well as the AO, the Arctic Oscillation, we remain negative for the next two weeks. And you can see the, uh, the latest EPS guidance from this morning kind of now flipping. It's, it's, it was warmer towards uh, Thanksgiving, and now it's kind of flipped more towards having some sort of system potentially coming in for uh, Thanksgiving. We might have some fireworks and a snowstorm that coming up the East Coast. So uh, I'll, obviously, I'll be talking a lot more of that potentially. But this is kind of my uh, overall winter thoughts on how I think uh, this winter is potentially going to play out. Yeah, we're, we're having a, a really cold November. It might uh, rebound and kind of go, go into a little bit more of a, a milder pattern for, for a couple of weeks there in December. And then I think we have a, a massive plunge in temperatures in, in January. And then we go, it's a late winter this year and extends into March, deep well into March. So that's kind of my overall winter thoughts for this year. Um, it, Please uh, subscribe to my channel and definitely catch me in the next video where I protect you before and after the storm.